Hello and welcome to the 75th episode of D&D Stories. I am your host, T the Writer, and this is the Book of Exalted Deeds. The Book of Exalted Deeds is a sort of companion book to the Book of Vile Darkness, and inside it defines absolute good for all of your tabletop gaming adventures in D&D. It'll teach you how to right wrongs, and how to triumph over the worst evils to fulfill your destiny. Don't we have a better clip than that? It is your destiny. Okay, now you're missing the point. Just just start the review. I need to get to my editor real quick. The Book of Exalted Deeds, like I said, is a companion book to the Book of Vile Darkness. It's the other side of the same coin as it sets out to define the nature of all things good, lawful, and holy. It even has the same mature audiences sticker that the other book does. When I went searching for why, it simply says that it's because it, quote, deals with tough questions of ethics and morality in a serious manner, and it deals with certain aspects of real-world religion that might make some people uncomfortable. That is, it uses the names and philosophies of Jewish, Christian, and Gnostic angelology. And yes, angelology is a word. Also, things like stigmata and holy relics with sanctified blood on them, that sort of stuff. So, the religiously inclined who are easily offended need not apply here. Also of note is that if you want to make use of this book, it really does view good and evil as mostly black and white. There's not a lot of room for gray area here. While it goes into the topics of good things like charity, chastity, healing, and personal sacrifice, it also deals with things that you shouldn't be doing no matter what. For example, if your party manages to capture a powerful lich alive and he has a number of prisoners buried alive in a crypt somewhere, you can't torture him for information to find those people. You'll have to think of something else. Torture is dishonorable. Osric won't allow it. God, I love paladins! It's his alignment. Yeah, they're lawful stupid. Many players would argue this to be the fastest and safest way to recover all the hostages as they could die or suffocate without the information, but this is not the way of good. You shouldn't use your power in this way, for it is not correct. According to the Book of Exalted Deeds, torture is an inherently evil act and should never be tolerated regardless of the circumstances. So in other words, the ends never justify the means. Another example might be if a party of adventurers went to a town that was being menaced by a dragon for their money and livestock. Agreeing to slay the dragon is an act of good, but asking how much you will be paid for it transforms it into a neutral act. I'll make you a fair offer. Take it, or leave him! You're looking out for yourself just as much, if not more than, your fellow man, so it's no longer considered a good act in the eyes of this book. It basically spends time splitting hairs like that. It can really be sort of a hard mode for paladins and clerics in that regard, as you have a much heavier risk of losing your powers or the favor of your god, as all of those things are defined in stone in this book, not just to the ambiguity of how the DM feels that day. Moral gray areas, complicated political issues, and other such things honestly have no place with the contents of this book. Even things like the concept of mercy is really doted upon here. A good character must always show mercy before a surrendering or helpless opponent, no matter how many times they try to stab you in the back, literally or figuratively. Now then, what is exalted? Is it like epic from the epic level handbook? No, not even close. 
Exalted tends to mean something like to raise in power, rank, or honor, but that's more of a World of Warcraft expression than anything. What exalted in this book means is altruism. That is, the belief or practice of selfless concern for the well-being of others. You know, being good for the sake of being good, not for some promised reward of riches or a paradise after death. To be an exalted hero, as this book outlines, you must be a hero for the sake of the betterment of the world. And I don't mean you have to spare every monster you fight or give every gold piece you have to the poor. You know, good doesn't even necessarily mean you're a nice person in many scenarios. It's over, son. Did she just fucking stab that guy? I thought that show was for little girls. Silence, you okay, well, enough philosophizing. What's actually in this book? Well, there's some variant rules for things like exorcisms and sainthood. There's smaller sections on exalted equipment, plenty of interesting prestige classes, some magic, and even stats for holy creatures like archons. What are archons? Basically, angels. Uh, not quite. More like this guy. You have no faith. Or this guy. Their stats are ridiculous. Ridiculous. Their powers are completely overwhelming. There's really no reason to stat creatures like this, but there they are. The statistically weakest one in the book is a challenge rating 22. Using even one of these in combat in a campaign would break the game wide open unless you've started your players in the upper teens in the level department. Not that you'd want to fight them, of course. Most of their saving throws are impossible, their grapple checks are ginormous, and their mere touch is deadly to those sensitive to holy damage. Honestly, almost all of the statted things in this book would better serve as Final Fantasy summons, one-time battle aids, or climactic appearances to test the mettle of your adventuring party. There's really not a lot that says that they're takeable. That's not accounting for the holy animal spirits, lesser gods, and high angels that this book has to offer. There comes a line in D&D that, unless you're setting yourselves up to literally kill gods, there's not a lot of reason to have numbers for these sorts of things. It would be like statting the Lady of Pain from Planescape. You know, her, her stats are you lose. There's no point to it. It just said, thou shalt not fuck with the Lady of Pain. According to the lore in this book, Zafkael is the only remaining original martyr that helped birth the idea of good and law into the universe. He can do pretty much whatever he wants magic-wise, and his stats are so outrageous they might as well not be documented. Can you see he's the man? Let me hear you applaud. He's more than a man. He's a shiny golden god. Undead below level 15 that even go near him are instantly destroyed, and those that are even higher than that are turned as though he were a level 35 cleric. He's basically D&D's interpretation of God. I'm God. Also of interest are plenty of outsider heroes like Vara, Duchess of the Fields. Much like the Archons and Zafkael, her stats are outrageous, she has a couple of paragraphs of lore to work with, and even a champion beneath her that would make for a good story hook. Vara is a member of a small group called the Gardenals. Basically, they're super adventurers with an animal-bodied theme. I'm sure the furry community will love them. But the same as the Archons or Zafkael, her stats are outrageous. I mean, it comes to a point with creatures like this that have so many abilities, so many spells, so many immunities and resistances and so on and so forth, it's basically like they need their own character sheet if they're going to be a part of your game. 
And if you do bring them to your game for a role bigger than, say, a benefactor or a quest giver, then your adventuring party is going to be playing second fiddle and playing it hard. Okay, I'm little. Been playing second fiddle and I don't get no respect. So enough about the superpowers out there. How about some holy artifacts and gear? Honestly, this is the funniest part of the whole damn book. One of the opening sections goes into detail about how poison and ability-draining elixirs are evil, and on the next page, it begins to list ravages and afflictions, which are just poisons by another name. Instead of causing ability damage, though, they can cause certain behaviors like coveting or drowsiness. Now, they only work on evil things, but they're still poisons. Don't bullshit me. It's a rose by any other name. Talk about hypocrisy. You think I'm poking fun just to poke fun, but the Exalted Equipment chapter is only five pages long. I mean, come on! Where's my holy swords? My specialized paladin armor? You know, the golden arrows that make skeletons explode no matter how much HP they have. Come on, give me something. There should be pages and pages of holy relics and other junk to just drop into campaigns at any given time. I know there are arms and equipment from other books that do holy damage, stop undead, and other stuff like that, but I feel like this was seriously a wasted opportunity. Five pages for equipment is a travesty when you've got a strong theme like this. Uh, okay, what else have we got here? Uh, next the book introduces something called Exalted Feats. Now, what is that? An Exalted Feat is something that only intelligent characters of good alignment and high moral standard can have. And it has to be given to you by a powerful agent of good. You know, a, a god, an angel, something like that. And they're earned, not chosen by the player, like a gift. Uh, most of them are upgrades from base abilities like Sacred Strike. This turns a rogue's sneak attack from D6s into D8s. There's also stuff that expands your choices for things like animal companions or wild shapes to include holy creatures. Adding the good or holy descriptor to a spell is also a powerful choice as well. Uh, my favorite was Words of Creation, which unlocks a language forgotten by even most angels. Uh, it's more potent than draconic in terms of magic, and it predates celestial. Uh, most mortals can only learn about four words before their heads explode. It's really cool. The prestige classes in this book are all very interesting. A number of them require you to take certain vows, and all of them are here too, you know, vows of abstinence, vows of charity, chastity, purity, etc, etc. Interestingly, most of them are entirely tied to role-playing and really don't hurt you or inhibit you stat-wise. But then again, most of this book is based around behaving in a certain way, so I suppose that really goes with the whole package. So be good, for goodness sake. Whoa! I think my favorite one is the Beloved of Valerian. Valerian is the god of unicorns, and the Beloved of Valerian devote themselves to him. D&D uh, &D has always been very explicit that you must be a woman and a virgin to have any sort of good interaction with unicorns, much less ride one. Uh, all the way back to the olden days of the game. So this prestige class, of course, demands that you be a woman, take a vow of chastity, and have a feat in mounted combat. They rest somewhere between ranger, druid, and sword-wielding cavalry. They're really cool. It's very interesting to see the mix and matches that happen with some of these prestige classes. Now, in conclusion, I really don't think The Book of Exalted Deeds is a must-have sort of book. It's an idea book, with some good prestige glasses and some very interesting lore packed into it. But the complete lack of holy arms and equipment, the ridiculously statted angels you can never really use, and the black and white nature of its rules can kind of be a downer. Unless you're running a really, really high-level campaign, or have some players that really want to be the paragons of good who could do no wrong no matter what, it's sort of useless. 
It's actually one of the skinnier books in the collection because it's missing so much that you would come to expect from a source like this. I'd say pick it up for the prestige classes and the lore that's written in the arch on stat blocks, but you're probably not going to use this one very often. I mean, it's really, really cool, don't get me wrong, it's just not practical on a game-by-game -game basis like, say, the Complete Warrior or the Fiendish Codex. I suppose the polite word would be hyperbole. It's not enough content to warrant a book like this, and what you do get is mostly so extreme that you won't realistically use much of it. I'd say pick it up if you want to run through some interesting angel lore, see some cool new prestige classes, or have a laugh at the hypocritical sections on poison and mercy. Just don't take this one too seriously. Hi guys, T here. Remember to hit that like button for me on your way out. If you'd like to see artwork and maps from my gaming table, check out the D&D Stories Facebook page. Also, I have a Patreon if you'd like to toss a few gold pieces into your humble bard's hat. Links in the description below. Keep gaming!